You're listening to the Wired for Impact podcast. I am here with none other than Brandon Dash Joe Colin Williams. Brandon, you are somebody that I came across online, and uh, you've <laughs> you've opened up a whole new world for me and quite a few other people. And by the way, for anybody that's listening to this, if you're offended by giant pickle shaped dildos and uh off color language and uh, that kind of thing this this episode is not going to be for you because uh, Brandon brings a serious amount of levity into an otherwise very confusing and very serious subject here so without further ado Brandon first and foremost thank you for being on the call today yeah man thanks I try um, to keep the podcast a little more g-rated just because you don't know but I do I am pretty clear on all the shows that I'm on like you know, I'm I'm pretty G-rated here, but my stuff is very like it's like fake antagonistic though. People people learn pretty rapidly. You know what I mean? Like well, anyone, I mean, I, I, anyone who I, can understand sarcasm, even in the slightest, they they learn real quick that like it's all just fun and games. It's the people who can't process any of that that run away. And you know, honestly, my material isn't really for people who fit that category. So it's I it's, was just it's sort of a natural filtering process. Yeah, it's brilliant, dude. I was going to call you out because I'm like, I see what you're doing, man. And it's very intelligent. Yeah. And even though it's, um, you know, even though it's fairly snarky and sarcastic and uh, and just kind of over the top, which <laughs> honestly, it does bring like some levity to this, this dense topic, you know, so it's super yeah. helpful. You, you've been to one person. I didn't really fully say this before we started recording, but I've researched some other people that have been putting content out there in this space. And you've done an excellent job of providing humor actually in helpful ways that captures the essence of certain things. And and quite honestly, when when you set, tell certain groups of people to kind of fuck off, it's like, oh yeah, that's right. Like it kind of feels good to yeah, yeah. just have that energetic alignment. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, well, so- A lot of it has to do with fan engagement. Like for example, uh, when I first launched the website, on March 14th or March 15th of, of 2022, it was just text. It was just the state national theory page. The state national resources page was very small. The theory page was probably less than half the size it is now. It was the first edition of everything, right? I would have maybe a few hundred people a month coming to the website, maybe 500 sometimes. It was like that for a while. And people were like, I just, you know, it's a lot to read. And and I didn't totally know about everything yet. I had a lot of the beginning information on a lot of things too, you know, and I was collecting information from everywhere. I had books stacked everywhere. I was actually doing some traveling. My suitcase was filled with books. I had books shipped to me through Amazon. So uh, I wasn't doing a whole lot of online research. I was doing mainly book research up until Christopher Hauser. Mm. So Christopher Hauser came out and then I was doing like a combination of Christopher Hauser and books. But the books is where a lot of the, my research was because there wasn't a lot of information you could find about this information on the internet. Uh, and if, if you did find stuff on the internet, it was just too confusing. But the books that I was able to find, I was able to find about 35 different books Mm. We're actually pretty good and pretty clear and pretty simple. Uh, relative, you know, it's all relative. Right. So when I released the first version of the website, didn't get a whole lot of traffic, a little bit. A lot of people were talking about it, but not a lot of people was that were actually consuming it. There's a big difference, right? Yeah. Uh, so I was the talk of the town, but nobody was really actually consuming my content with any real seriousness, except Joe Lustica and a handful of other people, right? So everyone was like, oh, we want a video course. We want a video course. We want a video course. I'm like, fuck you. Like, uh, you know, you you guys need to read. If you don't read, what's the point? Because I can give you all the video in the world, but then now you have to turn around and actually read United States Code statutes and stuff like that. Those aren't going to be in video form. You know what I mean? And then eventually after a few months, I was like, yeah, you know what? I'll just do a video course and I'll just take my entire state national theory page, which had grown and expanded dramatically during that time period. And I'll just make a video version of the state national theory page. So I had 37 different points on my state national theory page at that time. So I was like, all right, I'll just make 37 videos. And so I went through and I made 37 videos and I, and I, I, all I did, I'm telling you, all I did was, was think, eat, sleep and shit that course and how I was going to structure it and the outlines and the notes and everything for about five, five and a half weeks. I didn't even, I was mentally and emotionally checked out, man, for about five weeks. It mm -hmm. was, a, it was about 22 or 23 hours of video that I shot during that time. So then I released the course on July 2nd, 
of 2022 and then that's when that's when things fucking exploded but i continued my i continued my research and i continued to update my state national theory page but going back to my original point why i started saying all this the fan base is what a lot of all this stuff came from right so i had a small fan base prior doing all this and and during the pandemic i i said that my my dream was to create a new mask company called masks of compassion and it was basically just like like ball gags and like chin dildos and like leather zippers and like and the slogan was going to be do you even really care question mark right <laughs> <laughs> and i thought that was so funny right and then and then i had this this very small group of fans very 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 small group of fans right like maybe <laughs> 60 or something right and i would just put up dumb political stuff and jokes and all this kind of stuff right and then one day i promised my fans i said you know i promise one day i'm going to create an entire brand based off of self-deprecation and it was always like a dream of mine because i've been doing sales and marketing for so long like 13 years professionally and I just, I'm so tired of the bullshit in this industry. Mm -hmm. I'm so tired of mm -hmm. the, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest blank, fill in the blank. And every other fill in the blank is shit. It's mm -hmm. like, it's trash and no one it's educates tiring. anybody. And it's all just buy now, buy now. And it's all just, it's all just valueless trash that like assumes that every single human being is just this like push button automaton plastic piece of shit and it's just like awful okay so i was like my ultimate dream is to create an entirely new brand based off self-deprecating humor and for like a year i already owned one stupid fuck.com mm. i just didn't know what i was going to do with it yet mm -hmm. <laughs> then i found all of this information and i was like okay this is what i'm going to do right so then i created the course and if you watch the course at the top it just has my name. There was no logo. There was no brand at that time, right? And then after the course was done, then my fan base exploded. And then they were all talking about the cucumbers, 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 cucumbers from the course. Because in the course, I say it many, many, many times during the course. If you don't understand this information, go down to the market and get yourself a nice big cucumber and jam that fucking thing right up your ass. Because I don't give a fuck. <laughs> fuck you, basically. Right. And and the fans just loved it. The fans thought it was the greatest thing that's ever happened since the dawn of humanity. Literally. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, there's other things that I talk about in there. I talk about uh, how how lawyers suck dick like circus seals, and I go, and I'm like a circus seal. There's like a, there's like a few different like really funny kind of weird things that I do during the course, but the cucumber thing was by far the fan favorite. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I was like, go. here we go. So this is what they want. <laughs> so I, I I did a 99 designs, and I and I did a a, a contest, and I said. This is very, very strange, but I own the URL onestupidfuck.com. And basically what I want to do is I want to transform myself into a caricature of a pickle <laughs> that you jam up people's asses because they're idiots. <laughs> right? <laughs> Where the and, designer's like, another one? If I well, if well I had a at nickel. first at first we just got like one or two. Well, I, I put the the bid pretty high. I got the gold yeah. package. So I was like, I was like, fuck it. Like if I if I do the cheap package, like no one's gonna take this seriously. So I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna go for the gold. So I did the gold package and so then, they could take it seriously. So they knew you were a they very knew I was serious. serious. <laughs> yeah. They knew I was serious, right? Right. So I got a few submissions <laughs> and then I was very, very active with my fan base in showing them those submissions. And then as as the 99 designs started moving along it it became extremely popular and i had like 75 different submissions or 80 and then at the end there was three logos that i just fell in love with head over heels and i so i contacted 99 designs and i said i need all three of these i can't just have one and they said okay they said you're going to have to pay like three times basically and you got to award all three of them the money i said fuck mm -hmm. it so I bought three different logos. And so the logos came from my fan base. I mean, I I had a lot to do with it too, don't get me wrong, but the basis of all of it was from my fans. So 
it just continues to do that. And then one of my fans created the um, stupid fucking army picture, mm -hmm. which is the one of the pickle with the cape and the spear. So I just took that and I made a whole web page off of it, which is my fan art and submissions page. And then I created a whole Facebook group called the stupid fucking army. And then I made him the admin for the group, right? So a lot of what I'm doing is all fan based. And now, now there's these huge groups that are popping up. We have a group in London, we have a group in Belgium, and we have a group in Minneapolis. I'm sure there's other ones. I just don't know about them. I don't really care. I don't, I told them straight up, like, I don't really want to have anything to do with any of that. I mean, I just don't really care that much. But if you guys, like I said, if you guys want to do that, then, then you guys have my blessing 100%. And they just run all their own shit. So, so there's a lot of there's almost like it's almost like a giant marketplace where we're exchanging like information. It's like a non monetary. It's almost like a communal online. It's it's becoming sort of like a commune, like an online commune where we exchange information and stuff like that and help. But it's like it's non monetary, essentially, basically. Yeah. So right now, everybody that's listening to this is probably wondering what the fuck we're talking about. So I want to give people an overview of One Stupid Fuck and the Contract Killer course and to give them the macro perspective and then start to explain what is actually going on and how some of this stuff is legitimate. Because I'm sure when first people almost have to go through that process of when they first hear it going, no, no, that's crazy. You're crazy. You're smoking dope. What's that's no, I, I went oh, yeah. through that. Like I, when I first heard it like a couple of years ago, I was like, don't even bother me with that shit. Like that just sounds asinine. And then it yeah. kept kind of popping up. And then I kept seeing people, people that I knew and had credibility, like getting changing things. And so anyway, so yeah. for people that are listening and they have no idea what we're talking about, I think what's really helpful is to understand, um, to start at jurisdiction and, and to understand jurisdiction. I saw a video where this guy said, if you're an employee of Walmart and the manager says, look, you got to wear this uniform. You have to, if you want the job there, you're going to have to wear the uniform. Now, if that manager said, I want you to work at three in the morning, now he's breaking, he's outside of the jurisdiction of what he's capable to do. And you had some ability to push back, right? Because he's outside of that jurisdiction. And so if you think of that Walmart as a corporation and the manager and, and you being an employee of that corporation, there's certain things that you have to follow in order to be that employee. If you zoom out a little bit, you have the uh, city that that Walmart is in. And that Walmart may need to follow certain code for how they create the building and things of that nature. Then you have the state, right? That's a bigger jurisdiction. You have what we think is the United States and the constitution and all that. But that's the layer that a lot of people are getting lost in. That layer is really a corporate layer. So can you please explain the whole US corporation, quote unquote, theory or fact? And, and I say that because I know some people are going to hear this going to go, that just sounds crazy. Other people like yourself, myself, who have delved them in it will go, oh, nope, there it is. It's right there in, in black and white. So can you explain to folks what the US corporation is and how we sort of got into this mess? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I always I always do a show and tell, obviously, because like, uh, you know, my my whole brand is literally one stupid fuck and I'm a goddamn pickle. So I don't know why anyone trusts anything I have to say. And that's kind of part of the fun. It's challenging for me. So if somebody listening to this podcast were to go to uh, Google and you just type in 28 space USC, which stands for United States Code space three zero zero two and push enter, you're going to see a link for Cornell University, and then you're going to click on that, and it's going to say 28 US code, and then it's going to have this little weird S circle symbol, which means section, and then 3002, and then it's going to say definitions, and you're going to scroll down to definition number 15. Definition number 15 is United States means, and then section A, it says a federal corporation. So you don't need to take my word for it. You can look it up for yourself. And then the second thing that someone is going to look up is they're going to go to Google again in a new tab or a new window. And uh, UCC stands for Uniform Commercial Code. They're going to type in UCC space 9-307. Hit enter. You're going to go to Cornell University. There's other websites you can use. I like Cornell the most. So whatever. You're going to click on that. It's going to say it had that little weird S with the circle in the middle, which means section symbol again. And then it's going to say 9-307 location of debtor. 
you're going to go down to subsection H. Subsection H says location of United States. And then below that, it says the United States is located in the District of Columbia. So if someone's listening to the audio on this, they can just rewind and pause and, and look those up for themselves. And they can see that in, in black and white right there, boom, for themselves. They don't need to take my word for it. So essentially what it is, is the United States is located only and exclusively in the District of Columbia. So when you're filling out a tax form, let's say a W-9 form or a 1040 or whatever different form you're going to be filling out, the question they're asking you is how much money did you make from the United States or from areas within the United States or as a resident of the United States? What they're asking you is only and exclusively the District of Columbia. When you sign a W-9 form, if we go online, and I mean, this blows everybody's mind. This blows accountants' minds. This blows bookkeepers' minds. It blows HR Lawyers, minds. Yep. People start fucking freaking out, losing their shit. People, I've had, I've had so many lawyers just start comp screaming, totally freaking out, having like psychotic mental breakdowns on some of this stuff, right? So if you pull up a W-9 form or or uh, W-9 is what everybody pretty much knows. If you have a, a job and you work for a company, you signed a W-9 form. This is like a totally standard form. Everybody fills it out. But now under part two, if you pull up the W-9 form under part two, it says under penalties of perjury, I certify that. And then point number three is I am a U.S. citizen or other U.S. person. Now, the word U.S., the term U.S. means is short for United States. United States is defined as an unknown location located only and exclusively inside the District of Columbia. Then the word citizen, you look that up in Black's Law Dictionary because it's the legal definition. Citizen means somebody who gives dominion or power over to another entity in exchange for protection of their privileges or rights. So U.S. citizen, when you define it, it means somebody who gives dominion to the District of Columbia, which is a private foreign corporate zone in exchange for protection of their privileges, right? Now, the problem with that is you state that you live in Washington, D.C. when you state that you're a U.S. citizen. Washington, D.C. is not in America. It's a foreign, completely separate zone from America. When you do that, you are not an American anymore. When you are no longer an American, you don't have constitutional rights. You don't have the Bill of Rights. You don't have the right against self-incrimination as per the Fifth Amendment. You don't have the right to freedom of speech as per the First Amendment. You don't have any of these things anymore. So you go into a courtroom and you say, I'm, I'm a citizen. I have rights. You don't. You don't have any rights at all whatsoever. And then you hire a lawyer. And then there's other laws that say when you hire a lawyer, you waive all your rights. So you, you actually don't have any rights. And then you waive not having any rights. So you're like doubly fucked. And then you show up and then you say, I have rights. And then they throw you in jail for contempt of court because you totally do not have absolutely any rights at all whatsoever. And actually, in fact, after a long, long time of studying this, I finally did locate exactly what the right of a U.S. citizen is. Hmm. And a U.S. citizen only has one single solitary right. And that's as per the Supreme Court. And I will tell you what that right is right now. But can you guess what that right is? You have the right to pay taxes. Nope. <laughs> uh, I don't, nope. I'm not sure. And to be clear, just for anybody that's listening, what you're talking about by saying a U.S. citizen, this is what's been helpful about your course is sort of redefining some of these words so that we understand the relationships. It's almost like an employee to the U.S. corporation. Exactly. So you're talking about what is the right of that employee slash citizen to the U.S. corporation? I don't know. What is it? So here, this is this court case, U.S. versus Valentine. It's a Supreme Court case. The, the exact quote on this court case is, the only absolute and unqualified right of a United States citizen is to residence within the territorial boundaries of the United States. Hmm. So the only right that you have 
as a U.S. citizen is to be physically located inside the District of Columbia. So again, this is going to be crazy confusing for somebody who's just now hearing this for the very first time. I've been looking at this for a little over a year now here and there, not not as intense as you have. Your course has been very helpful to lift the veil a little bit more. But for those that are hearing this literally for the first time, what Brandon is actually saying, and again, you've Go verify this for yourself. Don't listen to him or me. And for the sake of this episode, this is for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only. Go do your own homework. But what people like Brandon are finding is that there is legal paperwork that has created corporate organizations, and we have unknowingly contracted ourselves into commercial agreement with these entities, thereby losing certain jurisdictional rights like I mentioned to you a few minutes ago in the Walmart example, we're now working for Walmart and we didn't realize it and we have to follow Walmart's rules until we don't, until we quote unquote kill those contracts, which Brandon's course walks you through how to do. What is confusing for some people is to say, well, wait a second, I, I don't even live near Washington, D.C. I live in Ohio. I live in Arizona. What do you mean I'm a citizen of the District of Columbia? Can you explain that, please? Well, you signed it under penalty of perjury. You didn't know what you were signing. You thought that U.S. citizen meant someone who lives in the 50 states of the republic. That's not what it means at all. Not even close. The way that the government looks at it is that they didn't force you to sign anything. You signed it of your own free will, and you signed it under penalty of perjury. So you're a perjurer, so perjury is a felony. Perjury is, I believe, it's up to one year in prison if you found guilty of it, right? So... Most of the country, almost everybody in the country, are all perjurers. They're all felons. In accordance with the way the government looks at it, is it's not our responsibility to clear and define all of your words. It's it's your responsibility. And we didn't make you sign shit. And now you're a felon and a criminal. So basically, the government looks at it in a way where it's like basically almost everyone outside of their corporate zone is essentially all criminals. The whole country is basically all criminals to them. That's the way they look at it, right? Mm. And on paper, that's true, right? Because the the only jurisdiction that the IRS and the government has to tax you is if you live in the District of Columbia. So basically, the way they're looking at it is, is they didn't force you to sign anything. You signed that totally of your own free will, stating that you live in the District of Columbia. Mm. So the thing is, is that that's how, they, that's how they tax you. You don't live in America. U.S. citizens are not Americans. And it gets even crazier because because now that you know that, there's another quote here I'd like to talk about. This is a quote from Hendrick versus Maryland. This one says, a U.S. citizen, upon leaving the District of Columbia, becomes involved in interstate commerce, and as a resident, meaning a resident of Washington, D.C., they do not have the common law right to travel as a citizen of one of the several states has. Hmm. So basically, a U.S. citizen has only one right, which is to residence inside of uh, Washington, D.C. When they leave Washington, D.C., they essentially become a rightsless, privilegeless, lost nomad that is essentially basically just completely just a, a drifter legally, right? So a U.S. citizen is basically like a drifting lost log. And that is why you have to get a driver's license. That is why you have to get a permit to carry a gun. That's why you have to get a fishing license. And they just keep issuing more and more and more of these licenses. Because the thing is, is that you don't have any rights. You, you are not an American. All of the rights that you want to have, you have to pay and request approval by your corporate overlords in order to get a corporate stamp of approval so that you as an employee of the corporation can do those things. It gets more complicated though, because technically speaking, those licenses only work in Washington, D.C. So a driver's license does not function outside of Washington, D.C., so technically speaking, a, even a driver's license or a hunting license or a concealed carry permit would legally only hold weight in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. So if, if someone was outside of Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. does not have the right or the ability to require someone to have a license to do anything outside of Washington, D.C. 
So the, the whole thing is all just a giant joke. You don't have, even with a driver's license, you don't have the right to drive. You only have the right to drive with the driver's license in Washington, D.C. Mm. So there's going to be a lot of people that hear that and go, dude, that's crazy. We've been doing this for decades, if not centuries. Like, well, well cars have been around for just over 100 years, whatever. But what are you talking about? What are you fucking talking about? I have a license. I got pulled over. Uh, the cop pulled it up. I had a ticket. I had a speeding ticket. Uh, I, you know, my daughter just got her license. We had to, like, you have to have a license, period, end of story. Um, there's going to be a lot of people that think that, say that, and I get that. I think where the proof of the pudding for me has been is that I've started to see and research and co and started to understand, first of all, constitutionally, we have a right to travel. And there is also a, once you understand that the driver's license has a commercial context to it, you, when you have a driver's license, correct me if I'm wrong, Brandon, but when you get a driver's license, you're essentially saying, I need this license because I'm conducting commercial, I'm either for hire or conducting commercial travel. Yeah. If I'm, if, and since most of us don't do that, we're driving to and from the baseball fields and work and whatever else, we're not Uber drivers and we're not working for the United States corporation. Therefore, we don't need a driver's license. You don't need a driver's tag, even a license plate. You can constitutionally, correct me if I'm wrong, create your own, your own uh, plates, your own tags. And also you can get a motor vehicle. What's it called? A motor vehicle, motor carrier, uh, motor carrier. Motor Motor carrier, uh, what? Uh, it's a it's a private motor carrier DOT number. Got it. That's a recent discovery, by the way. You call the DOT, and and they'll act like you're an idiot for not knowing about this. Uh, we didn't even know about this. So the DOT is is the Department of Transportation is the actual entire department of the government. So the government has 15 different departments, like the Department of State, the Department of Defense, the Department of the Interior. Okay, mm -hmm. one of the departments of of the government is the Department of Transportation. And people have seen that, like on motorcycle helmets, you have DOT approved. And, you know, DOT is not a completely foreign idea to people, right? Now, the Department of Motor Vehicles is a subsection of the Department of Transportation. So people have this flipped around. They think that the Department of Motor Vehicles is senior to the Department of Transportation. That is not true at all. The Department of Transportation is as high as it goes on the food chain of the section of the government that deals with transportation. It doesn't go any okay. higher than the DOT, okay? So that's the first thing. Second thing, inside the Department of Motor Vehicles, they deal only with motor vehicles. Common sense. <laughs> the definition of motor vehicle is something of which is basically only used for commerce. It's commerce only. Now, if you go outside of the Department of Motor Vehicles and you go up the food chain to the big boy, to the big daddy, the Department of Transportation, they will issue you a DOT number that has nothing to do with the Department of Motor Vehicles at all whatsoever. DOT numbers are not issued to motor vehicles. DOT numbers are issued to motor carriers. Motor carrier is an entirely different term. Hmm. Motor carrier can be either commerce or non-commerce. A motor vehicle cannot be non-commerce. Physically impossible. So like a lot of times you'll see in like a lot of the sovereign citizen type videos and stuff like that, the guy gets pulled over and he says, oh, I'm in my private mode of conveyance or, you know, blah, 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 blah. There's nothing to argue about. Are you in a motor vehicle? Or are you in a motor carrier? That's the first question, right? Now, if you are in a motor carrier, the second question is, are you in a for hire motor carrier, which is their words, not mine, or are you in a private motor carrier, which is their words, not mine? Now, those two things make all the difference in the world because a for hire motor carrier has to follow all the rules. And the police can do whatever the fuck they want with you. A private motor carrier legally owns the freeways when they're traveling on them. You own the fucking freeway when you're a private motor carrier. It costs $300 to get a for hire 
motor carrier DOT number. Hmm. It costs zero dollars. Absolutely fucking nothing. You don't even type in a credit card at all to get a private motor carrier DOT number. Almost like it's a right. <laughs> it's a right. Right. Now, so there's a lot of people pay- in this movement that throw whatever the flying fuck plates that they want. They manufacture plates out of thin air. They, they drive with no plates. You can do that. The police will do whatever they're going to do. Now, if you get a private motor carrier DOT number and you go online to something like buildassign.com and you place your private motor carrier DOT number in large letters on the back of your vehicle, in my opinion, that is the best way to do this. And you only need one DOT number for all of your private motor carriers. Hmm. So if you have 22 cars because you're Jay Leno and they're all for private use, non-commerce, you can create a plate that has your private motor carrier DOT number and you can go and you can have it manufactured. You want one for the front and one for the back probably. It's probably good. You don't legally need to have one in the front, really, because you're not in commerce. So all the little rules and stuff don't really apply to you. I think it's good. I have a couple for I have mine sitting right over here. I haven't put them on yet. This is fairly new, all this information. So if you have 22 private motor carriers, you would order 44 plates and then you would place them, you know, uh, buildassign.com. You can get each plate, maybe 35, 40 bucks. But when you buy more and more and more, the price comes way the fuck down. So let's say like like 18 bucks for for 44 of them, right? So you're going to spend maybe 500 bucks and then you never have to register the vehicle. You never have to smog the vehicle. You don't need to pay registration. You can't get tickets. The list goes on and on and on and on and on because you, it's no longer a commerce motor vehicle. You have completely and utterly changed the entire legal structure of your automobile to a private motor carrier, which is a whole different ballgame. Now, as a private motor carrier, you don't need a driver's license. You only need a driver's license to operate a commercial motor vehicle. And that's straight from the codes. I'm literally using, when I'm when I'm talking right now, I'm being very careful. I'm literally using their exact terminology. I'm not mm-hmm. I'm not even saying they literally says commercial motor vehicle and you it's blue and you can click on it and it has its own definition and they define the whole thing boom it's like i'm not even using terms of my own manufacturer here what i've been finding out in a lot of this stuff is that there are that there are manuals and that there are resources like you mentioned earlier the ucc uniform commercial code usc the united states code the other one that i found very interesting that you mentioned was the the styles manual you know, if yeah. if something's in all caps, what does that mean? If something has, uh, you know, capital first letter and then lowercase, what does that mean? All of this stuff can be researched and validated. So as you're listening to this, if you're if you're rolling your eyes or if you're going, wait, that doesn't make sense, or what are you talking about? Categorically, there is some type of resource that you can go to that literally plainly spells these things out. Speaking you can go online, about- and type in what is the definition of motor carrier? What is the definition of hmm. Motor vehicle. Uh, you can even type in like USC space definition space of space motor space carrier. And it'll show you different USC codes that define what a motor carrier is, right? Mm-hmm. Like, for example, in California, you can go right on the California website and you can type in motor carrier permit, MCP, and you can look it up and it'll come up and it'll say who needs a motor carrier permit and who doesn't need a motor carrier permit. And you'll learn very, very rapidly. You only need a motor carrier permit if you're in commerce. So the way it works is on the federal level, when you get your motor carrier, if you do a four higher motor carrier and you pay the $300 in California, you have to get a secondary permit called a motor carrier permit, right? So you actually need the DOT number and a motor carrier permit to operate a commercial motor vehicle or four higher motor carrier in California, right? Now it says right on the California website, if you're not involved in commerce, you don't even need an MCP. So once you get the DOT number, you're like 100% set completely, right? So I'll show you what mine looks like right here. 
I'm going to, I don't know like how serious it is to like display my DOT number on the internet. So I'm just going to put my hand over it. But so for those that are just listening, Brandon is showing it's, it's the size of a license plate that we're used to. It's black background with a yellow lettering. This is official guest of the United States pursuant to 18 USC section 112. And then it lists his DOT number, which he has covered up. The DOT number is in red. Uh, and then you would just put those in place of where we would traditionally have put our license plates. And then that, yep. And then that basically, and uh, is that metal or is that plastic or what is Aluminum. That? Aluminum. Aluminum. Uh, boom. There you go. So that is one way to quote unquote, uncontract yourself, kill that contract between yourself and the department of motor vehicles. I want to step back for just a second and go to the origination of the U.S. corporation, uh, which I believe was in the 1930s. No, 1871. Organic oh. Act of 1871. Organic Act of 1871. So that was when the term we now think of as the United States actually as a corporation was created, correct? That's also when the word person was redefined as well. Ex explain that because that's a big one. That that's a and another really good one to help people go. Oh wait, maybe not everything as I thought it was is as it seems. So yeah, explain what the definition of person is. So if you go onto Google again, and you're going to type in this time, you're going to type in twenty six space U S C space seven seven zero one. Hit enter. Go to Cornell University. It's going to say twenty six U S code section. 7701 dash definitions. You're going to go down to definition number one. And by the way, this definition is also locatable on the lower part where there's instructions on almost every IRS form. So you can find this definition very, very easily looking on IRS forms as well. Hmm. Definition number one, person. The term person shall be construed to mean and include an individual, a trust, a state, partnership, association, company, or corporation. So when most of us hear the word person, we think people, human flesh people. This redefines and helps people understand, oh, when they're saying, are you a person in the United States? What they could potentially be saying is, are you a trust? Are you a corporation in this entity called the United States Corporation? Are you a subset of this corporation? So I think this is actually the 1930s figure that I was actually thinking of, where they created the trusts, the Sestavi trusts. So the 30s, a lot of things happened in the 30s. You have the all the trusts were created through the Social Security Act, and then you also have the Emergency Banking Act, where they took away all the gold and they converted everything over to debt instruments and just debt, debt, debt. It's is it not? That's when we got central banking. Is that correct? I believe that's no. That. Central banking was the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. Or 1913, that's what it was. Okay, yep. So a lot of that started in the 1913 then when the central bank came in or was it the, the gold a, thing? A lot of this, a lot of all this craziness really, really, I mean, the country pretty much went to shit in uh, the 1870s is pretty much, 1860s, 1870s. That's pretty much when, after the Civil War, during the Reconstruction, that's when the 14th Amendment was made. That's when the word person was redefined. That's when the government was bankrupted and closed and then reopened as a corporation. That's when basically everything happened right after the Civil okay. War. So, dude, this is mind blowing. For, again, for people that are just now finding this out, this is fascinating and obviously uh, history that we don't know a lot about. But when you understand that, oh, the country went bankrupt, central banking came in. They created a U.S. corporation. Explain what the Sestavi Trust. Well, is. I don't well know the, the, the timeline is a little bit different. So you have the you have the Civil War, and then after that you have the Reconstruction. That's the way it's described in, in history books, right? The Reconstruction after the Civil War. Okay. At that time period, that's when the entire government was closed, the original government, and then a, a, a duplicate clone government was opened that was incorporated, and that was all that information is located in what's called the Organic Act of eighteen seventy one. Hmm. During that time, the word person was redefined to include a corporation or a trust or an association or a partnership. During that time uh, is, is when a lot of crazy things happened, terrible things. Then time goes by and then we have the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. That's when the central bank was installed. Mm -hmm. Then you have the Great Depression after that. Then coming out of the Great Depression, you have the Emergency Banking Act 
and you have the Social Security Act. Those two came out around the same time period. What that did is that made every single human being collateral on the bankruptcy that the corporation had towards the Federal Reserve. Oh, that's sorry, also what that's also the when they Securities con- Act. Yeah. Oh, so I the Social Security earlier, the Social Security Act made all of us collateral on the debts. Okay. People mm-hmm. are collateral now, right? Because people are so basically what happens is during that same time period, that's also when they created the whole birth certificate scam and all that kind of stuff, right? So all of that was born out of the Social Security Act. And then it was also all the gold was seized in the Emergency Banking Act. The Emergency Banking Act is also where there's a lot of really good information about how since no one can pay for anything anymore because only gold and silver coins are defined as money, we can actually just discharge and set off all of our debts, right? A lot of us are right now actually right as we speak doing a lot of research into this area in particular because we're trying to crack this whole set off discharge thing. So all of us have the ability to set off, which means essentially to correct or or balance an account without having to actually pay Federal Reserve notes at all. It's based off of a, an infinite credit supply that was given to us as part of the Emergency Banking Act of 1933. Fucking mind blown. So what people think of as money is actually just debt, where it's just exchanging debt. If you look at a $20 bill or a $1 bill or a $5 bill, I have one right here. I know most of your people are, are audio, but We'll do this for the video, people. So if you look at the top of a Federal Reserve note, see here, it says Federal Reserve note, right? Yep. So what is the definition of the word note? You look that up in Black's Law, th- th- there's a whole bunch of definitions, right? The definition of note is a promissory note. So a note is just a promise to pay. That's the definition of note, right? So now you ask yourself, okay, it's a promise to pay. Who's paying who, right? The answer to that question is the corporation known as United States is promising to pay the Federal Reserve at some point in the future. So this is not money. This is actually just a contract that's made out of mostly cotton and fabric. It's not actually paper. People think that these are paper. They're actually mostly like cotton and fabric. That's why they have that kind of different feel. They don't feel like paper, right? Mm-hmm. There is some paper in here. But you can actually look up what is a Federal Reserve note made out of physically, and you can look that up. It's kind of interesting. So this is a promissory note, right? That's all it is, right? And they they don't hide that. It says right on the fucking top and the front, Federal Reserve note. What's a note, right? So all you have to do is just when you start going down the rabbit hole of, of what is a note and what is a promissory note, who can create promissory notes, how are they exchanged? And you start getting into all this stuff. You go down that rabbit hole long enough. And you're going to wind up in what's called the Negotiable Instruments Act of 1882. And basically, the word instrument means like a debt instrument or a note or a promissory note. It's all the same kind of wordage, right? Negotiable means exchangeable. So like, for example, this is a negotiable instrument. It's actually not money. And the reason why it's a negotiable instrument is because I can give this to you and you can give it to your friend and your friend can give it to their friend. And whoever holds this note possesses the value of the note. So it's negotiable. Now, if I write you a check, like if you open up your checkbook and you look on your check, not every single bank, but most banks, somewhere on your checkbook, it'll say non-negotiable. Does it say that anywhere on your check? I'm looking at a check right now that I got from the bank when I first opened an account. And so these were not like, it was like literally when I first opened it, the day of. So I don't think Probably not. I mean, it says uh, it on but, here. But a lot of checks say non-negotiable on it. They're non-negotiable because you're writing the check to a specific individual, to a specific person. Mm. So if I write a check to Peter, not anyone can go and just cash that thing, right? And that's why it's non-negotiable because it's, it's not easy to exchange, So a note or a promise to pay that's easy to exchange is called a negotiable instrument. Mm -hmm. And you can find a lot of information on the internet about it, but it all goes back to the Negotiable Instruments Act of 1882, I believe, right? Yeah. So the way it works is a promissory note is extremely simple. It's a promise to pay. You know, you can go online right now and you can type in what is a negotiable instrument composed of 
And you can go to like Investopedia, you can go to like any of these websites and they'll teach you. It's very simple. It's like five or six elements. One of the things that a negotiable instrument has to have is it has to have the amount. Another thing that a negotiable instrument has to have is it has to say the amount in digits and words. Hmm. That's why I check you write out in words how much, and then you have the number on the side, because as per the negotiable instrument act, you have to have both for it to be considered a negotiable instrument. It has to have a date on it or, or payable on demand. It has to have some sort of time related element to it. It has to have a signature in order for it to be a negotiable instrument, right? So when you learn what a negotiable instrument is composed of, you sit back and you think about it for a moment and you say, my God, this is so simple. What's stopping me from creating negotiable instruments right now? And the answer is absolutely nothing. In fact, Congress, through the Emergency Banking Act of 1933, Congress has given you and, and completely supports your ability to create as much and as many negotiable instruments as you could ever want for your entire lifetime. Give me an example of what somebody would, use, would do with that. Well, basically, one day when you keep studying all this, you realize and you wake up one day and you realize that you are a bank and you are a bank that can produce as much money as you want whenever you want just by signing and drawing up simple contracts. And then you keep digging even farther and then you find out that the Federal Reserve will take your negotiable instruments and exchange your negotiable instruments for Federal Reserve notes. And then you go even deeper and then you realize that the banks can't actually deny your request for credit. It's actually illegal. So all you have to do is just draw up a fucking negotiable instrument for $20 million, give it to the bank, the bank denies you, and then you, you say, hey, wait a second, you actually can't deny me as per these particular laws. They go, oh shit, you're right. And then they give you your money. And they're so not giving you... They're not giving you any money. Banks never give you any money. All they're doing is they're, it's basically a currency exchange. It's like exchanging French francs for Italian, whatever, liras. I don't know what they are. You're, you're exchanging your own manufactured negotiable instruments for a different type of negotiable instrument, which is mm. these. Mm. Yep. Your promise to pay when you sign it is just as valuable as one of these. It's the same thing. It's the exact same thing in law. So then the rabbit hole gets deeper and you say, okay, how about a mortgage or a car loan? Well, on your mortgage, what did you do on your mortgage? You promised to pay. And did you sign that promise to pay? Well, yes, you did. So what happened to your mortgage agreement? Your mortgage agreement was a negotiable instrument. Where is it now? So the thing is, as soon as you signed your mortgage agreement, you technically just paid for the entire house in full cash. This is hard to get my mind around, if I'm being frank. Like, I, I, I am not there yet. I don't discount it or or disbelieve you yet. But I my I am not there yet. I'm not that far down the rabbit hole. I But I've heard other people say this, and I'm trying to wrap my mind around the economics of this and or how that's even possible. Uh, I don't the reason why the reason that. why the system was set up this way is because crazy criminal people, uh, as long as they know how to work the system, they have infinite money prior to all of this insanity being installed with the central banking system. You couldn't do any of this crazy, goofy shit. Right. So when I started to hear about this stuff, I dismissed it. I thought it was crazy. The one thing that actually started to get me to scratch my head was respect to what you're talking about right now. So, for example, when uh, and this is specifically what it was, two things. Somebody mentioned to me, they said, when you were born, you were considered, well, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. When you were born, there was a trust that was created. There is an all caps, whatever your name, your given name is, there's an all caps parallel trust that was created. Your birth certificate is a financial instrument mm -hmm. um, of which there is a bond number on. Mm -hmm. And uh, and when your social security was created, if you look on the back of your social security card, most of us think of our social security number as the seven digit number that we all use or whatever, seven, seven digits, I think so. Um, eight digits, nine digits, whatever. But nine. on the back, on the, nine digits, on the back of that card, there's off a red number and that red number is a bond number. And you can go to treasurydirect.gov and enter those bond numbers and find out the value of those bonds. That to me was the first. Well, there's another website. Are you familiar with uh, GMEI -E Utility? Utility? Yeah. 
Well, here's the deal. So, so a lot of people start here and they get very excited about all this information. Okay. Now, as you dig deeper, you realize that you have infinite credit and you can, you can pull on that credit and manufacture as much credit as you want whenever you want. Now, personally, I don't, I was involved in the whole trust thing. I tried to access the trust. I wasn't able to, blah, blah, blah. I know people who have done it successfully. Uh, it's it's not as simple. I think they've changed a lot of the rules recently because so many people were trying to access that money. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more exciting. And, and frankly, I think it's a lot more realistic to manufacture money from scratch and infinite credit rather than trying to access the trust accounts. I am still working on accessing the trust accounts. But when you realize you have infinite credit, what do you need Federal Reserve notes for? I'm with you on that. I think the the point I'm trying to make is that people can go actually to that website, the gmeuiutility.org, and enter their social security number, and you can see that it is a financial instrument that's being traded. That yeah. to me was the first like, oh wait a second, there's definitely something going on here that, like, what the fuck is going on? And that for me was like definitive, tangible data to look at and go not everything is as I think it seems to be. And so that's what created the curiosity for me to dig a little bit. So I agree with you. That I, from what I understand, it's been very difficult for people to get any kind of clear answer as to how big those, uh, essentially how much is in your trust. We're all beneficiaries of a trust that apparently has millions, if not more in it. But to your point, and I'm again, I'm not quite there yet um, in my understanding, but what you're suggesting is that forget the trust. You can just create <laughs> infinite credit under this system. Yeah. Right now. And, and the way that I can prove actually to all your audience without even just talking about it, I can actually prove that the social security account is an account that makes you the collateral to the debts of the United States. You're actually going to go again to Google and you're going to mm -hmm. type in CFR stands for code of federal regulations. So what you're going to do is you're going to type in 20 space CFR space 422.104. Again, that's 20, so 20, space CFR, space 422.104. Hit enter. Cornell, I like Cornell, so I use Cornell for everything. Click on that. It's going to say up top, it's going to say 20 CFR section 422.104 dash who can be a, assigned a social security number. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to scroll down and it's going to say persons eligible for SSN social security number assignment. It's going to say we can assign you a social security number if you meet the evidence requirements in this other subsection. But if you look, the word you is blue and it's clickable. That means there's a special definition being used here, right? And Cornell is pretty cool because they link the special definitions into the actual statutes. I don't think a lot of the other websites do that. If you click on the word you, the definition pops up. It says you means an individual who owes a debt to the United States within the scope of this subpart. And you can actually click on, it says right on the upper right, source. So what's the source of this definition? The source of this definition is 20 CFR 422.402. So if you click on that, now we have 20 CFR 422.402 dash what special definitions apply to this subpart question mark. Scroll down to the last definition, E, <laughs> U. <laughs> means an individual who owes a debt to the United States within the scope of this subpart. And the word United States means an unknown location inside the District of Columbia. So these are all secret hidden definitions. You, they say you, 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 and, and you means debt slave. That's what you means, debt slave to corporate, to the corporation. <laughs> Dude, it's... It's a, it's such a maze and people who are, uh, again, just starting to peel the onion layers back, it's like, why is this such a maze? Why is it so confusing? Well, let me get your take on that because I, I have an answer for it I, and I have a feeling of what your answer is, but why is it so confusing, so entangled? It's not, it's not like that on purpose because the, if, if they were clear about what they're doing, oh my God, there'd be gallows outside of Washington, D.C. Like all of Virginia would become basically a giant processing center. I mean, you know. 
uh tar and feather baby yeah so so you know and i don't i don't uh i don't condone that by the way i'm very clear about that in all my material you are which uh, by the way that's a that's a big reason why i like your stuff because besides the ridiculous humor uh which i honestly help finds me better understand all this shit this is a path forward of nonviolence, of civility yeah. Uh, and you make it very clear, like, don't be a dick and be polite. And this was the other fascinating thing that I learned just watching your stuff. You're like, the more that you you would think that there's this big opposition that's trying to keep you in the dark, or whatever. It's all there in the open. And from you, as I've been watching your course, the more you like peel the onions layers back, the more they're helping you do it. It's almost yeah. it's it, and is it not because 95 percent of the government doesn't have a clue about any of this information? Yeah, the, the yeah. chance, the chance, the honest to God chance that you're going to speak to someone or send a letter somewhere where they're going to have any clue about any of this information is so slim. I mean, the closest you're ever going to get to people who know anything about any of this information is the uh, the Department of State Passport Processing Center. When you go to do your new passport, so you're going to get a, a national of the United States passport, they know about some of this information. I, I Obviously, they have to. It's just absolutely a fact, right? Besides those guys, you know, most of the people in the IRS are not going to have any clue. Uh, it's not until you get up into the higher levels, the processing levels and stuff like that. So I start, you know, you start sending things in, you start sending in requests for special EIN numbers and stuff like that. I sent in documents that I wasn't sure if they were even going to approve. Uh, they're pretty wild documents and they are issuing us EIN numbers based off of those documents. They are calling employers to help us strong arm employers into accepting W-8 BEN forms which basically means you never pay taxes again. The IRS is actually assisting us to get documentation filed because the employers are so frightened by the documentation. And by getting those documents done, the IRS is physically assisting us to never pay taxes ever again, legally. Incredible. As we're kind of starting to wind down on time here, do you have, what's your recommendation for somebody who's interested in doing this for the first steps for them to take, like, do you do you recommend that they file something with the IRS first that they get their oh, motor no, no, no. motor yeah, carrier like yeah what's your what's your process the first thing is to learn a lot some Once people like learned. Joe Lustica you know you want to go around and and send 480 documents everywhere fine uh you know i i love the guy to death he's got the balls the size of fucking jupiter you know that wasn't me that wasn't me it was a, a very long slow process for me right so now everybody sees me and I learn something and I jump on it in three seconds and I, and I'm very successful all the time. Well, yeah, because the first two years I didn't want to hear any of this. And then for six months, I didn't say a fucking word. And then now here I am eight months deep in total insanity and massive website and massive fan base and people feeding me information and groups and everything. So, so now I'm at the point now where, yeah, I can grab something. I have so much background information. I can plug it in and ha start having success right away. Okay, so mm -hmm. my my free course is an excellent first step. It's free. The reason why I have the state national theory page is because I prefer to read. So I kept that there and I update that. That's sort of like my update spot. That's where the hottest, most interesting information is. I don't teach you how to fill out a lot of the forms and stuff like that on the theory page because it's just too complicated. But in the video series, the free course, I go through a lot of the forms line by line by line with you. So the best thing to do is to read the state national theory page, but to also sign up for the course to do both. Right. And then in the course, I show you tons and tons and tons of resources. Like, for example, Weiss and Associates, they have tons of really good videos on this and they do all sorts of services for people. PCS 1-308 on, on Instagram. There's uh, State Nationals Rock on Instagram. There's Jalil Bay. He has a book. I think it's called um, The Zero Percent. Or maybe I'm thinking of somebody else. But anyways, there's there's a bunch of different resources. You got like what you were mentioning. You got Christopher Hauser. You got Anna Von Reitz. You got David Strait. You got and, and everybody says different things. They have different ways of teaching. And anyways, blah, 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 blah. It's not my job to tell people who they like the most. Some people can't stand my material. And, and very, very heavily devout religious people are very open about how they're very sad because they see that my information is so good, but they can't bring themselves to consume it. And they're very, they're very polite about it. I don't tear 
those kind of people apart. I mean, if, if they're going to be a total asshole to me, I might tear them apart. But but a lot of times it's it's actually very respectful, highly religious people that are just uh, not going to consume the information, which is fine. I don't. It's that's, fine. I don't really, you know. Yeah. The, the thing fair. is, is that it's not. It's not, you know, the, the the part that's that's, you know, my my information for most people, they realize very rapidly, it's all just a big joke. It's not really serious, yep. you know. So that's yep. kind of the, that's kind of the crux, right? Because some people think I'm actually being serious, and it's like, wow, you don't have the, you know, if a person has such a low ability to process sarcasm, that's just, you know, it's just not going to work. You know what I mean? So from there, I help you branch off into all sorts of different other resources. And I have a whole section on my state national resources section of like books and huge document treasure troves and, all, you know, definitions of all sorts of different words. And I have a whole section on my state national resources page where I break down all of Title 18, which is all about crimes, criminal penalties. And it's like a shopping list. And you can find almost any crime that you would ever want to pin on somebody for doing something bad to you, you can find out how much monetary value it is or how long they're going to be in prison. And I I dumb all that down and it's all there. It's mm. all in subsections like financial crimes or police related crimes or traffic related crimes. So there's a lot of different things and a lot of different resources. And I'm very, very open and clear about all the different people that I've learned from and all the different resources that I've consumed. So that way you can branch off in 18 different directions to whatever you want. You can find the resources that connect with you the most. That's how I do it because I think that's important because everyone's going to learn in a different way. There's a lot of people Agreed. who might prefer, what's his, uh, the bad wolf, uh, James, 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 Lovett. James Lovett yeah. or, yeah, he's or good. Christopher Hauser or whoever else, you know what I mean? I've looked into both Chris and James and they've got really, really great stuff and they know their stuff forwards and backwards. Part of the frustration that I had with them was I always was entering the conversation in the middle of the conversation. There was no real clear starting point. But James is getting some better stuff out there that's helpful, I think, for that. But you've got a really good zero to like, okay, now I'm dangerous kind of path. I don't mean that in a in a violent way or anything like that. Like you just knowledgeable zero to okay, I get what's going on rather. And so shout out to them for sure. There's a lot of great stuff. When it comes to the source documents that we were talking about before, the USC, the UCC, uh, you just mentioned the CFR. What are some other base source document acronyms that we should be aware of? Uh, there's a lot. What are the there's... main ones? It depends on what you're looking for. Uh, okay. There's, I mean, okay. So for example, if you, if you wanted something that you can use for credit related transactions, in my opinion, one of the most powerful uh, US code is 15 USC 1601. Basically what this one says is that Congress is saying that you have the right to ask any question and understand any of the terms or any of the words or anything associated with any disclosure of credit related activities. So when you start asking about negotiable instruments or coupon payments or set offs or any of these kind of things, you'll start finding that people are very weirded out by it and they don't really understand it and this and that. You can use 15 USC 1601 and say, hey, guys, I have the right to understand this. If you look up the American Express terms and conditions, nobody ever reads any of their terms and conditions or their card member agreement. If you look inside the card member agreement for Amex, go into your online bill pay or whatever, and there'll be a section and you can click on download card member agreement, right? If you, it's not, once you go through my course and stuff like that, it's not terribly difficult to read. You're going to go down to the section that says how to make payments, which is on page number two of 10. And it says here how to make payments. And it says here when making a payment by mail, there's a few bubbles. And bubble number three literally says write the account number on your check or negotiable instrument and include the payment coupon. <laughs> it literally says that right in the fucking card member agreement. So you, you think to yourself like, okay, the card member agreement says that I can pay with a negotiable instrument. And then you say to yourself, okay, 15 USC 1601 gives me the right to ask absolutely any questions that I need so I can understand my credit agreement. They don't have the right to not answer your questions. They have to. Congress has commanded that anything you want to ask, they have to answer. Now, 
people will say, oh, I'm going to use this and I'm going to get on the phone and I'm going to fucking crush these fucking people, blah, 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 blah. Well, okay. You want to be a fucking dick about it. What's stopping them from just hanging up on you? What are you going to do about it? Are you going to file a lawsuit and push and push and push and take the lawsuit all the way to a trial by jury because you're upset that they're not following what Congress has stated? If you are, then fine. If you're not, don't be a fucking dick. Because if you're a fucking dick, that's what you're going to have to fucking do. Yeah. So you have to ask yourself, am I willing to do that? If the answer is yes, then be a fucking asshole about it. I don't care. 15 USC 1601, you have to answer my questions, motherfucker, blah, 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 blah. Okay, get ready to start in small claims court, to do an appeal, to, to work your way up, work your way up to a fucking trial by jury. You know, set a date for a trial by jury. And by that point, I guarantee you the credit company is going to acquiesce and they're going to do whatever you want by that point. Because mm. they don't want a bunch of people in a room talking about negotiable instruments and coupon payments. OK, right. So you have to think to yourself, OK, if you're kind of new to all this information, chances are you're probably not going to be ready to go down that road. So you have option B. Option B is to be very kind and to be very understanding and to create a relationship. And to ask questions and just say, look, you know, I've been digging around on this. I'm reading the card member agreement. You know, I, I found 15 USC 1601 that states that, you know, I just want to get some questions answered. I just want to understand my credit agreement. Who can I speak to? Can I speak to a supervisor or someone that can help me understand my card member agreement? Now, ideally, you do all this while you're still making your payments. You just keep making your payments with Federal Reserve notes. The account's not in collections. The account's not late. The account's not fucked. You're just calling as a completely normal consumer with a completely normal account, asking some questions about the account that you have that you're paying and current on. Mm -hmm. What are they going to do? They can't do anything else. It's like, okay, like we need to find somebody who can answer this guy's questions, right? So that's the way... I'm going to be doing it. I'm still at the very, very tail end of just making sure I completely understand all of this. But essentially, as of this last week, I've come to a lot of new realizations about all of this, which is a lot of what I'm, I'm actually speaking about brand new information that's just come out like days mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is kind of like the path that I'm going to be walking. And I know for sure, for a fact, this is a path to make this happen for people who want to make this happen. But a lot of people just send in a coupon payment or a negotiable instrument and it gets ignored or they get a denial letter and then they just give up. Right. And the thing is, is that that's uh, the people that you're sending these things into don't understand any of this, even though it is in the card member agreement. They don't ever see it because there's almost nobody that knows any of this information. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have to be ready to. You know, the the big misunderstanding that people have that makes them so fucking angry is they think the person on the other end of the phone or the other end of the letter mm -hmm. means them harm. Mm -hmm. And they don't. Mean and that they know and they're hold it, withholding it from them. And Exactly. And yeah. they get all fucking butthurt and angry about it. That's not true, man. There is very, very few people that have any clue about any of this. I think this is really part of the quote unquote great awakening. And if we look at it from that perspective, it's like, oh, shit, I've been asleep this whole time. I didn't realize this was out there. I'm now discovering that there's these things. I'm kind of fumbling around, figuring it out. I'm politely saying, hey, I'm just looking at your own definitions and your own words and our own agreement. Doesn't this mean this and this mean this? Help me understand that. Oh, it does mean that. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Like, Let's just all wake up together politely, uh, kindly, serving each other, and let's all wake up. To, like, We don't have to have... A massive conflict it doesn't have to be that way. We can do it in a way that's that's you know kind and peaceful. Yeah, and think about it: when you're talking to somebody over the phone, even even if you're talking to a, a phone person at American Express, shit, man. I mean, they have just as much right to send in negotiable instruments on their Amex account as you do. Exactly. I've, so who's I've to say who's to say that? <laughs> Who's to say that you call in and you talk to these people and they're not blown away and they don't look at just say, oh, excuse me. Uh, uh, what was your name again? Oh, Liliana. Oh, Liliana. So I'm looking at the card member agreement page two under uh, how to send in payment. 
uh, by mail, bubble number three. Do you see that there? Do you see it says about how I can send in a negotiable instrument with the coupon? And you just say, you know, what what exactly are they referring to? Because I'm looking at investopedia.com and it says here an, a, a negotiable instrument is a promise to pay. So does that mean I can just send in a promise to pay? Uh, or, or can I just promise to pay this bill and, and sign it and send that in and that'll discharge or set off the account in some way? By that point, they're going to give you a supervisor, okay? Because they don't have a fucking clue. They've never looked at the card <laughs> member agreement, okay? And then you're just going to work your way up the line by doing that. And you're just going to ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. And then as soon as you get a supervisor and they start to get angry with you or something like that, you go, excuse me, excuse me. My account is not delinquent. My account is is fully paid. I've been a member of American Express for X amount of years. And 15 USC 1601 does state that Congress has specifically stated that if I have any questions about a credit related agreement, I have the right to ask questions. You seem to be getting very upset right now. There is absolutely no reason to be upset with me right now. There is nothing I have done to deserve you being upset with me right now. I, I pay all my bills on time. I have, have been late very little or once or twice or whatever. I'm just trying to understand what's in the card member agreement. And you can say, you know what? When I first signed up for this thing, I didn't read the card member agreement. And you know what? That's my bad. But now I am. And 15 USC 1601 states that I can ask questions as regards to my card member agreement, and I can ask as many questions as I want. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I have some questions. Are you willing to follow 15 USC 1601? Are you willing to follow what Congress has said I have the right to do? Or would you like to grossly violate my rights right now and, and not do exactly what the law says that we need to be doing right now, which is to answer mm -hmm. my questions? Mm-hmm. You can get a little bit, you can get a little bit stern at that point, but you're not going to do that with, with fucking some Filipino that you first get that doesn't know a goddamn thing. Yeah. I, it's, it's important to remember that there's a lot of us that are asleep. Been watching some of James's videos. He's had some very interesting, uh, he's had a, a lot of law enforcement, perhaps you have too, that have been watching this stuff, uh, IRS agents and cops. He's like, I can't tell you how many cops I've helped. Um, <laughs> exit out of the system or at, at the very least my brother is a fucking employees. cop my brother is a fucking cop and he's like an old school sheriff mentality type cop he's a really cool dude right he's live and let live if you're not hurting nobody leave him alone that's how he operates right he operates like mm -hmm. an old sheriff right he's a cool mm -hmm. dude he's a smart guy i've talked to lots of cops and i don't believe that cops are horrible terrible people and I don't think that cops know what's going on. And I think, in fact, a lot of cops are starting to wonder about some things. Yeah. You know, cops are generally, I mean, think about this. Cops are generally pretty right-leaning. You ever, you ever met a fucking left-leaning police officer? Couldn't tell you. I've met a few. I've met, that, I've met that one. Great, but I've, I've met, met I've met one, and it, he wasn't like fully left-leaning. He was like partially left. Even more, he was more moderate. He was more cent yeah. centered, right? Yeah. Anyways, but your right leaning people, pretty much every single red pill channel that you see all over Instagram, all over Facebook and everything, the state national related material is bleeding into all of these channels like crazy. It's like there yeah. was like a this giant dam, like the Hoover Dam that someone put bombs on and blew it up and it all went into all these channels. Everybody's talking about this shit right now on the right. Yeah. Yep. So you got to think this. to yourself what channels are police officers going to be tuned into most likely right leaning channels. Okay. So everybody's getting exposed to this information right now, which is exactly why you're seeing this TikTok ban fucking massive, horrific legal thing, the reserve act or whatever the, f you seen that thing? You seen that thing? Coming I, out? I have, I've heard it's a Trojan horse. I don't know. Well, it's very, why, very but... open. It's very, very open. They're saying that basically anything on the internet that we don't like, it's a million dollar fine and 20 years in prison. It's basically that that's the whole thing in a nutshell. It has nothing to do with TikTok, not even in the slightest, right? Mm -hmm. What's funny is this is the first statute or legal document or or law that I've ever seen come out where they're specifically targeting state nationals. They have mm -hmm. a foreign individuals section where mm -hmm. they can actually label any foreign individual as basically a terrorist of the state <laughs> and foreign individual means state national 
So mm. this thing is blowing up so much that they're actually starting to rewrite the language of the acts to include us. Mm. If you're a state national, aren't you outside of the jurisdiction of their legal authority? Well, yes. And, and we are actually called internationally protected persons as per 18 USC 112. But, you know, there is some truth in the fact of if they figure out a way to label some foreign individual as a terrorist and then, you know, this and that and, you know, whatever, they're going to do whatever they're going to do to some degree. I mean, we all right. know to right. some degree <laughs> they're going to do whatever they're going to do. But they, they do they do consider their own statutes as essentially their Bibles. People think that they're always just going to do whatever they're going to do, always. And that's not true, actually. The statutes to these people are like religious texts, okay? But those religious texts will only go up to a certain point. Mm -hmm. But that point is a lot higher than people think it is. Mm -hmm. That's why when you have a cop that goes way, way out of line, they do stomp on that. Because the thing is, is that they don't want people to lose their trust in their system. Mm -hmm. Because their system is essentially a control system, right? The, the statutes and the UCC and the USC and the CFR, these things are control mechanisms because people say, that's the law, I trust the law, and they never read the law. And that's the control mechanism, right? Yeah. They don't want cops going around and doing totalitarian shit because that that releases the emotional, mental control grip of the trust of law. Right. Hence the spiritual battle that we seem to be in. What are the um, specific contracts that you've quote unquote killed? Like wh how much have you spit yourself out of the system? I work on it all the time. I mean, I, I, it's like a hobby for me now. Uh, True. But like, so for example, like you were showing your plates, you talked about the discharge on the credit cards. You haven't done those yet. What do you have that's verifiable? I have done those. I have done those. So I, I already discharged $200,000 with American Express. Wow. My accounts were closed. They started sending some lawyers after me. And then I sent one letter and the lawyers immediately uh, acquiesced. And they actually sent me a letter stating, we are not going to report this and we are not going to pursue this at all. And I actually have that, that letter. That's the second conditional acceptance that I sent them. I have those videos are all on my, if you go on my contract killer course, sign up page on my website and you scroll down the page there's a bunch of videos down there that are from the contract killer course. Those are all conditional acceptance videos. And then below the second conditional acceptance video is the actual original letter scanned into my computer from the law offices stating that they're not going to be pursuing that to any farther. Right. Mm. So you can see I've sent a total of three conditional acceptances, all three of them. Two of them were to American Express and one of them was to an insurance company. And you can see those videos uh, conditional acceptances are a bit advanced. I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend people watch those videos until they've gone through video number 15 of my contract killer course. That's where I start getting into the theory behind conditional acceptances. If you watch those videos, you're going to just not really totally get what's going on. I don't yeah. think. Fair but enough. After, what, what I'm trying after to video do is 15, just... you're going to start really learning that and that kind of thing. But basically like to continue to answer your question, yeah. I have a special passport I've already informed the IRS and changed my status with the IRS in great detail. I have a good relationship with the IRS as a foreign beneficiary, basically. I, I'm, I'm no longer domestic. I'm non-domestic. I live uh, what is called without the United States. Is the the, uh, foreign term. being outside of the District of Columbia. Exactly. Which means yes. outside of the United States. That's what Outside that of the United States Corporation. Well, it's just the United States. That's that's legally how how it. You wouldn't say United States Corporation. You literally say outside of the United States, non-domestic to the United States. Yes, so you're if speaking you're, the if technical you're outside term, of yes, if you're outside of the District of Columbia, you are without the United States. You are a non-resident alien. You are non-domestic. People think those terms are only used for people who are outside of the 50 states of the union. That's not true. Right. All of those terms are for anyone outside of Washington, D.C. Have you traveled with your passport internationally? No. Okay. But I know many I've people heard, who have. 
I have too, and I've heard that they've had like separate lines that real quick they're in it like they don't put it on in lines or not with the rest of the peasants who had don't even waken up yet to all this shit. Um, but yeah, I've heard I, I, I didn't personally it. experience that. I went to the front of the security line to go through to my flights and I gave them my passport and I said, I have a special passport. Does this mean I still have to go through security? And he looked at it and he said, Yes, you still need to go through security. I've heard people who don't have to go through security. I've heard people mm. who get waved through customs. I've heard people who don't get waved through customs. Uh, again, it comes down to no one has any clue about any of this yeah. information, including yeah. TSA, including the airport, including you, you, you can safely assume basically pretty much everyone you're going to talk to, unless you're sending letters to like the secretary of state or something like that. You can pretty much assume they don't have a fucking clue about any of this information. Yeah. So for those that are interested in going through your free course, I've gone th through most of it so far. It's it's really, really good content, really good information. Um, where can they go and where else can they find you on the social channels? Uh, my website is sort of my central hub for everything. I have links to literally everything there. All my content, all my podcasts, all my guests guest spots like this one will go on my podcast page all my social media everything all my course everything's on one stupid fuck.com <laughs> <laughs> oh man and if somebody's an asshole where should they shove the cucumber uh straight up their ass straight up their ass that's right okay <laughs> just want to finish taking notes on that uh very good uh brandon dude this has been beyond enlightening and i'm sure crazy for many people, a fire hose of information. I was hoping to get like sort of a chronological thing, but as we got into it, it's like, there's only so much we're going to be able to cover in the amount of time that we have. If we've done nothing but just pique somebody's curiosity, I think we've uh, we've moved the needle. And um, once people go to your, your site, onestupidfuck.com and take the contract killer course, I think they're going to find out more information. So let me, last question, why are you doing this? What's the motivation for you? I love America. And I, I, when you start studying a lot of this stuff, you see that America has gone, man, but not completely gone. Like all the original law and all the original structure of government is actually still fully functioning. If you go into a courtroom and you start bringing up original law and you start to bring up the old stuff from 200 years ago, they, they know about it and they accept it. And it's actually fully functional, even in the corporate world. So it's not completely gone yet, but the, the lights are, are dim, man super yeah. fucking dim i mean america is close to support. Yeah. obliteration i mean because because there will be a day the whole point is there will be a day when they when the light gets low enough and it gets low enough and it gets low enough and no one will notice they're going to turn it off yep yep i think we're dangerously close on that especially if you look at what's going on with the fiat currency with the geopolitical things that are happening right now we're getting dangerously close now that might mean that we have to fucking restart it you know that may not be an easy process there can be a 2.0 version you know i i have a very optimistic feeling not that it would be easy but i think that we are going to have a resurgence of freedom and not just in america i think it's i and i think we're already seeing it in the world belgium is huge belgium is a i have a France very large pushing group. back yeah brazil's uh, pushing brazil's back. brazil's pushing back really hard africa is pushing back really hard it's the final boss battle because you got to think about it this way like all the wars that we've had in our past um they were all basically extensions of the globalists the globalists yep. were behind all of it. So, yep. so even when we beat Hitler, we didn't really beat the true source of the problem. We beat a secondary tentacle from the original source, right? This battle that right, we're currently fighting right now is the source. Yep. This is the source of everything for hundreds of years. Yes. But so this is the final boss battle. And, and people have heard about different prophecies of a hundred or a thousand years of peace and all this kind of stuff. So if we win this boss battle, we will be experiencing an extremely protracted long length of time, basically an entire era of peace. And I say an era of peace because if we fall asleep again or allow this to happen again, then we will experience this whole thing again, but it won't yeah. be for many, many hundreds, if not thousands of years. Yeah, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. It's it's a fascinating time to be alive. Uh, yeah. Brandon, thank you again, man. This was brilliant content. I love what you're doing. Big support you. of yours. One stupid fuck.com. <laughs>
love it. Thank you for listening to this episode of Wired for Impact. If you're interested in creating and expanding your impact, be sure to visit us online at impactnow.com.